Hey Data Junkies, welcome back for another episode into the module on simple linear regression. In our previous video, we set up the basic foundations. We're talking about what the OLS linear regression is, kind of how it works, how we computed the slope value, how we computed the y-intercept. And now we're going to go ahead and shift our discussion into the topics of model fit. Talking about things like R squares and Fs and just generally understanding how this regression model is going to work. Our next videos are going to take these foundations and put it into R where we can see it in practice. So let's go ahead and talk specifically about model fit. Now regressions are a model. All the different statistical tests that we've been doing are indeed models. But this particular one, when we're talking about regression, uh, they're specified by the analyst, they're fit using sample data, and they're interpreted based on some sort of amount of reality. Now what we're ideally trying to do is develop these sorts of regression models to fit reality as we go. Uh, the data science is a big popular topic right now. Quantitative analysts, data analytics as well, are exploding fields. And regressions are dominant by many of these sorts of analytical roles. And oftentimes what these people have to do is have to come up with regressions and models to explain something that's going on in the real world. And so what they're trying to do is make sure their models are looking like what should happen out there. And we'll talk more about when these things start to differ later. Now, if you ever hear me use the term, or if you come across the term specifying the model, that's a fancy way of saying, what are the variables that are being used in your model? How are they being constructed? How are they being written out, right? So that's what we mean by specifying the model. Now, when we're talking about regression fit, earlier I had said that we can look at y hats, and y hats are the fitted values or predicted values. We say these are the things that we know from our independent variables, our explanatory variables. And based on those, we can find some value of y, that y is the y hat. And that's going to be based on our best guess scenario from the data we have. Now, every time you go out and get a different sample, it's most it's going to be quite likely that you're going to get different coefficients in your regression, just like you would get different means when we did the exercise on uh, exploring sampling distributions and the central limit theorem, that as you go out and get sample and sample and sample over iterative sampling processes, you're going to go out and get different results, but those results should start to approximate out to what you would find as the population's parameter version for those. Now when you do these regression models, they're going to generate for you an R-squared. We talked about R-squared when we were talking about correlations. And we talked about R-squared when we talked about one-way ANOVAs. And we talked about uh, it at other points in time when we were saying that R-squared is the amount of variation you can explain based on what you know. And so in this case, when you're talking about your model fit, a higher R-squared is better. And that's saying that your predicted variables, your independent variables, are doing a better job at their prediction. Now this could be treated as a sort of an effect size for your regression model, but you need to be a little aware and cautious that if your R squares are getting too high, that can be a bad thing. We're going to come back to that later. But just keep in mind that if your R squares are too high, you could be over predicting things. Now when we're talking about this model fit, we're talking about what best describes the data. The method we're using in OLS is the method of least squared error. As you get to different types of regression, you will have different types of model fit on there. And with this method of least squared error, the goal is to minimize the error in the model. It generates for us the line of best fit. Line of best fit does not necessarily mean good fit. You may have data that is curvilinear, having sorts of bends to it. And so we would need to adapt this. And linear regression doesn't like curvilinear data. So keeping in mind, good fit and best fit are different from each other. Now, let's go ahead and talk about how this fits into a hypothesis test. In the foundations video, we said that each intercept, each coefficient in your model has its own p-value, has its own little hypothesis test to conduct to say, is the slope equal to zero or not? Is there no association there? We can apply a similar sort of understanding to the entire regression model itself. Now we can talk about these hypotheses for your regression with an f-test, where the f-test has a null and an alternative. The null is going to say that you can predict your regression model better with just the mean of the dependent variable alone. You can imagine if we had a group of data for heights of everybody in the class. And if I was to ask you, what is the best measure that's going to represent the height for everybody in the class? Most of you would probably say the average or the mean. Some of you may, case, may make a case for the median, 
but most cases we're going to say mean so long as it's normally distributed. Of course, if we're skew, that's when we make a case for the median, and of course that's when we can talk about other sorts of regression models. But in this case here, what it's getting back to is this idea that we can predict your dependent variable better with just the mean of the dependent variable. We don't need any independent variables, any explanatory variables, to help us with the prediction. The alternative is going to say, no, that, that's not quite right that we can do a better job by including some independent variables. They're going to contribute some fundamental knowledge that's going to help explain the predictor variable. And when that's the case, then the alternative is going to do better. And the, the f-test is going to be a ratio of how well did your model do with your independent variables to how well did it do without the independent variables. And that's going to generate your f-score, which the f-score can then get a p-value and see if it's statistically significant or not. Now that f-score is tied to the r-squared. And the r-squared is going to validate these results, and if, it's going to say if the r-squared is equal to zero or not. The null is going to say the r-squared is equal to zero. And r-squared is zero means that it's not predicting any of the variance in your model. So in that case, your independent variables aren't doing any work. They're kind of lazy, hanging around, sitting on your couch, and not doing any effort into your regression model itself. Where the alternative, the r-squared is not zero, you've got good friends that are doing some work and helping you along in your particular processes here. So when we're testing the fit of the particular model, right, we want to keep in mind how reasonable this fit is. And we've got three different types of variability we can talk about. Now, this shouldn't be entirely new to you because a lot of this is drawn out of our talk from the ANOVAs when we were talking about sums of squares and amount of variability. So we have a sum of square total, which is the total variability, all of the possible variation that could exist in your model. The SSR is the sums of squares residual, and so this is the amount of variability for the stuff we can't explain, the noise, the residuals, the stuff left over, the errors. SSM, this is the variability of the model. This is saying how much variability is there from what we can explain to the mean points themselves. If we were to look at this graphically, it, it makes a bit more sense when we look at it graphically. So the SST, this is the total possible variation. If we were saying before that you could predict your variable better with just the mean of the dependent variable, then the sums of squares total is taking into account each of our plot points and the distances from those plot points to the mean of the dependent variable, the mean of the dependent variable, valuable, the mean of the dependent variable, the predictor variable. So that's going to take into account our total possible variation. Then if we look at these sums of the squares residuals, we said before the residual amount is the distance from your plotted points to your regression line. So the sums of squares residuals are the distances from the sum distances from all of your plot points to that regression line. So then the third point, the sums of the squares for the model, the stuff that we can explain, that's going to be the distance from your regression line to the mean of the predictor variable. Okay? So the first one total was points to mean line of the dv. The error was plot points to the regression line. And then the model was regression line to the mean of the dv. That's taking up the account of how much variation you're able to explain. So when we have that, we're back into this sort of ANOVA territory where the total variation is both the combination of how much your model improves by plus the error. And those two would sum to the total. If your model error is improving, then you're going to expect that your model variation is going to be larger than your error variation. And once you have that in sort of that ratio, I told you that before that the f-test is a ratio, so you have how well your model is doing in the numerator being divided by how well your model is not doing the error in the denominator. And that gives you your f-statistic based on these mean squares. And I also mentioned before that R squared is looking at the same sort of idea. So the F test is how much you could explain over your error. R squared is looking at how much you can explain over the total variance. And it comes out as a proportion. So we can express it as a proportion or as a percentage. And so the higher the percentage, the higher it is that you can figure that the amount of variation that's being explained. Let's look briefly at two different sets of plot points and their R squared values. The one on the left has an R squared of 0.15, or about 15% of the variation explained. The one on the right has an R squared of 0.85, or approximately 85% of the variation explained. Note how the one on the left, the dot points are farther drawn out. It's very uh, distance from the regression line compared to the one on the right. So what we're saying, and this goes in line just as we had with regression, I'm sorry, not regression, correlation. 
the stronger the correlated values, the more tightly and compact they're going to cluster around that regression line. The same is holding true when you square those values. They're going to be closer towards those regression lines. And what it's saying here with R squared, when you're talking about your model fit, is we're saying the distances from those plotted points to the regression lines are getting smaller. We're minimizing the error. So the one on the right that has the larger, larger R squared has a smaller amount of residual error individually and at the sum compared to its one on the left. So keeping in mind, when we talked about R, we said, you know, it has some weird things going on with it and we have to be careful of it. So R, because it's a percentage, it is mathematically possible that you could get to a value of 100, meaning you're explaining 100% of the possible variation. But that would mean it's perfectly predicting. Can you imagine anything in the universe? Now keep in mind, when we're doing these predictions and models, there's a universe of possible explanations as to why something is what it is. So could you imagine knowing exactly 100% of the reasons why something is what it is? Why is an apple red? Why are you taking the stats class right now? There are a ton of possible reasons that could help explain these things. So if you ever hit an R squared of 100%, you should certainly scratch your head. If you get anywhere near 100%, start scratching your head and wondering why. Now, mathematically, R squared is sensitive to artificial inflation. We're going to definitely hit back on this when we get to multiple regression, but when you're still in simple regression, we need to keep in mind a couple things. One of them is what we call overfitting. So if your data that you're using in the regression here has variation in your sample that's not present in your population, that can cause R squared to become higher or potentially lower, depending on how it works out. But generally, we're concerned with the higher, that you're having more variation that's being explained in your model because your sample has extra variation that's not represented in the, po in the population. Similarly, with data mining, data scientists and analysts that are doing these sorts of exploratory analyses, they're mining for correlated types of values here, and they could be coming across correlations that are popping up by chance, but not because of causal relationships. And that's going to cause them to get these higher R squared values that aren't going to come across when they get out to the real world because these, re these aren't actually going to have actual relationships. They're just going to have correlated relationships that's going to drive up their R squared value. And we can find these sorts of things out by looking at diagnostic plots and residual plots, which we're going to get to later on at the end of the module here. Uh, and we're going to come back to R squared and something we call adjusted R squared when we transition into multiple regression. Now when you're talking about model aspects and things to consider, we want to think about that having unspecified variables, things that we haven't taken into consideration, can lead to biasness. We also want to ask ourselves, are we reshaping our variables in any way? Are we transforming them, standardizing them, or otherwise doing things to them that could potentially change how the model is being fit? Again, as I said, if you're overfitting or data mining your models, this can lead to misleading results, which can, of course, increase the risk of your type 1 error. So you may come across some extra false positives. Now, in this case, we're only talking about in terms of linear regression, but a lot of these concepts also apply to nonlinear, which we're not covering in this course, but you would then be able to compare the linear versus the nonlinear modeling effects to see which one might be better off for you. And that's going to go ahead and wrap up this little talk on model fit and the things that we consider. And we now have everything that we're going to need to start putting this into R and looking at how we can conduct these regressions and start interpreting these regressions there. I'll see you in the next video.